Wait a second. This isn't your grandma's cancer show. Not your grandma's cancer show. Hi, I'm Tatum Duroc, and today we are talking all things cancer, sex, and intimacy. And who better to talk about that with than Cheryl and Sarah, who run the Cancer, Sex, and Intimacy Project. And we featured them on a section of our um, podcast last year because they were part of Shine Connect. But this time it is very exciting because I have them virtually live in the studio with me. So I'm chatting with them over Zoom right now. Welcome, Cheryl. Thank you for having us. Yeah. Lovely to meet you, Tatum. Yeah, it's lovely to see you. And hi, Sarah. Hello. Thank you. Yes, thank you for having us. <laughs> so I'd love to dive in with like the first question that I ask everyone. And let's start with Cheryl first. What was going on in your life when you were first diagnosed? Um, I was working full time, diagnosed in July, when was it? 2016. And I started off with a, an operation followed by um, monthly treatment on hormones. And then I came across a lovely Sarah about two years later, just, just under two years yeah. um, into, my, into my diagnosis. And how was it meeting Sarah? The best, one of the best things that ever happened because we're very like-minded. We never met before. We, we were put together, or, or should I say, I attended one of her wonderful sessions, which was to do with cancer, sex and intimacy. And um, what we didn't know is that we both had a, a similar project in mind. So Macmillan actually thought of us doing a joint venture. And this is how we began. Oh, that's brilliant. I'm almost seeing kind of like cosmets like coming together. There was kind <laughs> of like some universal collision of planets to bring you two together. And Sarah, what was happening in your life when you were diagnosed? So when I was diagnosed, I was about 26 at the time. Um, so I was studying um, full time. I was studying wood carving and gilding. It's quite a niche subject. And um, I was also working part time. It was quite intense, a lot going on. Um, so I remember thinking all the symptoms I was having for um, what was later diagnosed as Hodgkin's lymphoma, put that down to stress. I put it down to taking on too much and wasn't really listening to my body in the, in the way that I should. Um, but then a lump popped up on my neck, which was something I definitely knew I needed to take seriously. So I was um, diagnosed in uh, January 2017. And yes, it was, again, about two years after the start of my journey that um, I started working with the lovely Cheryl. You met at a talk and then you were deciding to change the world? Yeah, so we met, uh, it was about October 2019. It was at um, Shush, which is this amazing sex positive um, shop that used to be in um, the Shoreditch uh, kind of Hoxton area, but it's now mainly online. So it was there that I was uh, co-running a session with Shush and uh, someone from, someone called Emma from Macmillan Cancer Support. And it was a group of women coming together just to talk about their experiences of cancer and sex and how it had affected their, their relationship with um, sex and intimacy and pleasure in their bodies. So it was wonderful to meet Cheryl there and just find someone that also yes wanted to pretty much change the world especially relating to cancer sex and intimacy it's a you know it's a big part of who we are as humans you know we're, we're sexual beings if the, and if that's what we want to do we have the right to pursue that that pleasure absolutely i think it's so important and and it's so easily brushed over i know one of you described it as feeling a sense of injustice, that it wasn't even discussed with you. Could you share a little bit more about that kind of feeling of injustice? For me, it was um, just, it was never mentioned as part of my cancer treatment. And um, so fertility was talked about, you know, that's brilliant, very important, but the, the sex and pleasure and how my treatments, um, so I had a stem cell transplant, very common to go into early menopause, which I have done. And, you know, none of the sort of sexual side effects that can come up from that were ever, ever talked about. And just sort of 
being on chemotherapy and navigating um, having treatments that are naturally going to affect your body and your libido. Um, it was never brought up, it was never asked. And when I did finally pluck up the courage to ask, I remember being really shut down. Um, I called up my uh, cancer nurse specialist, someone that I did have a good relationship with and thought I could have those conversations, but she sort of clammed up a little bit and said, oh, I've never heard of that be happening before. <sighs> Try some lube and just kind of shut the conversation down. So that's where the injustice really, I really started to feel it after that point because I'd done the thing that was scary. I'd asked, but yep. I didn't get the answers. Yeah, and that's when you've gone out on a limb like that, when you've mm. summoned up all of that and gone, mm. no, this is important. I, I need to ask this question. Mm. And then that response of, I haven't heard of that before, which is one, so crazy, uh, because you'd think that would be pretty yeah. much a fairly regular occurrence. Yeah. Um, and it is, it is, that's it. You know, people yeah. we talk to, it's it's, it's very common. Um, and Cheryl, was uh, that the same for you as well? Were you told anything about it? Absolutely nothing. It was not discussed until, I mean, I, I've been diagnosed now for six years or six years ago, and it still hasn't been discussed. The closest it came to any form of discussion was um, I had four rounds of radiation treatment last year. And in the booklet, it says, do not sleep in the same bed as your partner for 21 days. What does that mean? Mm. Does it mean I shouldn't get in the bed, but we can have sex on the sofa, <laughs> sex in the kitchen? It's safe everywhere else, just not in the bed. And it, yeah. I just could not believe it. I, I remember just looking through the booklet thinking, oh, that must be just a summary. Let me look at the back. Or when I go to the sessions, they'll mention it. Zero. <gasps> Yeah, and this and is radiation so, treatment. So many questions in that. Like, why would it say not to sleep in the same bed? Can you cuddle? Can you have sex? But then just, is it the amount of time? Like, you can't be eight hours touching your partner, but two is fine. Mm -hmm. So many questions in there. People have so many questions, don't they? So I imagine mm -hmm. when you're running your sessions, and I'd love you to you know, explain kind of, you know, if someone comes to um, an event that you're running, what, what can they expect? Oh, they can expect so much. The first thing they can expect is fun. Excellent. Because at the end of the day, sex is supposed to be fun, pleasurable, something that you enjoy and not something to be embarrassed about. We know that obviously when you've got a cancer diagnosis, it's serious and you might have, you know, life um, threatening issues going on and you've got surgery and treatment but what happens when you've got through that process in your you, you've gone through that part of your journey and you want to connect with someone or your partner or find a new partner you need to talk about those things you need to be able to participate if you want to and you could have had surgery that's life altering in terms of how your body looks how it feels how it responds so if someone comes to our event they can just First of all, expect fun and some laughter, but obviously we'll touch on the serious issues and so forth. We're not medical specialists, but we will talk about our own experience. And obviously we've got like Shush, the woman's store, who are just amazing at delivering information for, for people. I imagine people coming to one of your events, and I know for myself, that there's a certain amount of grief that has happened before coming along um, of the sex that they used to have, however that would look. And, you know, what are some of the feelings that people have expressed to you around that? Yeah, that, that, that is definitely that um, something that a lot of people bring to the table because it's, it's, it's when you've been experiencing sex in a certain way and you have been able to connect in a pleasurable way and it's something you enjoy and it's a way that you perhaps connect with yourself or with your partner or perhaps you're you're dating and you're enjoying kind of experiencing pleasure with different people it's something that really is um you know it's hard and it's it's allowing yourself to grieve for that is important and to understand that perhaps how i was having sex then might not be possible now 
but there are alternative ways to experience pleasure. And that's what a lot of the workshops are about, is finding those new routes to pleasure. Um, because something that perhaps um, gave you pleasure before might not um, in this present time, whether you're recovering or you've had some kind of body altering surgery, but it's it's kind of allowing allowing yourself to rediscover parts of your body because i know i certainly felt there was a, a a kind of a grief or or a a disconnect from my body post um, stem cell transplant and what i wasn't able to gain pleasure from anymore and it has it's taken me a reasonable amount of time to redefine what i like and rediscover res- discover new things as well which is brilliant but it's allowing yourself that time that it is a process and it's okay but there are ways to rediscover things because really cancer gets in the w- in in so many ways right i mean it, it just takes over in so many ways so it can be a, you know treatment related low libido and like just not wanting it which is you know a certain type of confusing feeling to both crave that intimacy and yet the idea of it just makes you want to vomit it can be such a head fuck you might have had surgery in the regions that you used to use for having sex or that your relationship has become so strained as a result, your partner doesn't want to break you. Can you think of other ways that like, you've heard about cancer getting in the way of intimacy and sex? One of the um, ways that cancer really gets in the way is the fact that people are scared of breaking each other. Mm. So first and foremost, if you're with a partner and they know what you were like pre-cancer or pre your diagnosis or your surgery treatment, and they see you in a more vulnerable fragile state they'll be afraid to approach you or even think or be too embarrassed to approach you for sex because they might think oh it's not appropriate she's going he or she is going through such a really turbulent time should i really be thinking about sex let alone expecting it Mm. the person who's in that position is thinking exactly the same thing so eventually they'll they'll basically start doing this or if they're not with a partner they won't look or seek a relationship because they're so scared of how people will see their bodies see you know listen to their journey and think oh no I can't touch you yeah and you know, I, it's really difficult it, it really is and it's something that can't show up on a survey like how many yeah. people maybe they don't break up maybe that can be picked up but how many people's relationships become fractured you know they stay in a relationship that they shouldn't be in because you know they're like oh well they stay with me or you know you know all those different things or we stay in it because we love each other but we're not really intimate in any way anymore you know that's gone Um, and the guilt that can come from that and all those different ways that that connection becomes fractured how that can spill out into other parts of your life and your confidence as a person i just think the work that you're doing is so brilliant i'm so glad that you're out there championing this um, because i think it has been not talked about enough and it has been kind of shrouded in kind of well you've survived cancer get on with it right yes (laughs) exactly exactly and that's not the only thing you know it we appreciate that it's not all there are not all all circumstances where it's appropriate to talk about sex or intimacy. We, we absolutely respect and get that. But it's if and as and when a person decides that they want to engage in intimacy, why not? It could be something that's discussed in the beginning with their oncology team and picked up later on as a matter of, a, you know, as an issue that well, we discussed it 12 months ago. Where are you at now? How are you feeling? But that doesn't happen. No. It doesn't happen and then people are sort of embarrassed into this silence of don't talk about sex you're lucky to be alive this this is disgusting it's not appropriate that's maybe to you it's appropriate to the person going through it and why should they be silenced because of how you think or feel it's nothing to do with you yeah and it's almost that we top trump ourselves right so like even within for example i didn't have 
cancer in a sex organ, for example, you know, so therefore there are people more affected than me. But actually, the stress of it can cause sexual dysfunction. Any kind of treatment can. Um, And I know for myself, I used to have amazing orgasms. And afterwards, they were such, I mean, little tiny blips of just like, why bother? Why bother? Mm. And that Mm. didn't seem like something that you could ever share or ever even complain about because it's not the worst thing. But actually, did that make me feel really sad? Yeah. Did it feel like a loss that wasn't like held or grieved? And, you know, even by myself, it was kind of like I'd go, ugh and roll over. There's no pleasure in that, you know, Mm. being reminded that sex become this reminder of this brokenness. I'm wondering, have you heard that from other people that almost it's easier sometimes not to do it than to venture into that space? Using the word brokenness is so, um, it's definitely something that resonates with me and, and a lot of people that we talk to. It's, it's, and, and then that feeling of, of, of confusion and, and, and feeling like com- completely alone within a situation, it breeds fear as well. The idea of trying to be intimate with someone or, of, or, or with yourself, perhaps masturbation or something, it's, 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 there's a fear around it because it's, it's something that, um, that does generate those feelings of, of great sadness. You know, like you said before, it's like so much is lost to cancer mm. and pleasure is really one of them. It's like whether it is libido or whether it is access to, to orgasm, um, it, it really is is something that a lot of people feel and it is that fear, that loneliness. Um, but also, yeah, that kind of thing, well, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm doing okay. Should I really be this isn't something that I'm. I, I should be worrying about, but of course it is. Um, and for a lot of people we talk to, one of the things they say, it's like, this is actually the thing that is causing me the most upset and stress post-cancer or during cancer. Because um, so many people, of course, live with cancer and live, sex and intimacy and pleasure is very much part of living for a lot of people. So it really is something that comes up a lot. That, that that fear. Um... Do you find that men and women talk about it differently? I did an online session back in 2020, and they def- men definitely have a different approach to cancer, sex and intimacy. I think there's more silence for the men. I think they want to talk more, but they are, they think differently in terms of their openness. So they might talk to one good friend. They won't necessarily come along to a whole session mm. with a group of men and share it in that way but they certainly want to talk about it that i do know the the men that were in that session wanted to talk about sex and intimacy and how it affected their their lives with their partners um it's just a shame that it's society as a whole i think the approach it's taken it's cancer and sex just don't go together cancer and intimacy just don't go together and if you're a man oh you keep that to yourself so and that's not healthy that's the thing is when healthcare is kind of setting this standard of not talking about it, it then makes yeah. it harder to talk about it. Whereas if you're a clinician, it was pretty relaxed about it. And it's like, you know, just wondering, are you having any impacts on your sexual health? You know, you can c- completely talk about it in a, in a health umbrella. I think they sometimes forget that sexual health is health. That's something that definitely came up on a, a previous podcast that we were we're talking about queer sex and and some of the things that you know doctors were even more like oh we don't know what, we don't know no. what to say yeah. um, but remembering that it is it is under the health umbrella once it comes under that then it also empowers people to have those conversations because it's been legitimized exactly yeah. exactly and psychological health your mm-hmm. mental health is equally as important and people don't see the connection between the two. They just think, here's cancer in a box, sex and intimacy is over there. They think of it as the physical yeah. and not mm-hmm. as the mental. I thought that part of my life was over and um, and that no one would want me again. 
Um, wow. And it wasn't until I was talking to a lady about 25 years older than me who hadn't had cancer. And she was like, oh, you know, like finding a boyfriend and everything like this. And I was like, what? What? <laughs> oh, I'd given up on that being a possibility. And that was a, a mental, but also kind of when I did get to see the right doctor, that changed. Um, now in a very nice relationship, having a lot of fun. Um, with Shine's demographic being the 20s, 30s and 40s, that thing of sometimes thinking like, oh, is that just what I need to put up with now? You know, Ooh. I think sometimes we can sort of age beyond our years. And it's not until you hear of someone in their 70s and 80s still at it that you're like, oh, wait, hold on. Have, have I written myself off too soon here? Um, you know, like, actually, there's no reason that to not have sex for however long you want to have it for. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. I think it's so, yeah, I mean, it's it's that. It's, it's like I definitely felt like... Um, like my ability to have sex had completely changed and what that meant for going forward and then becoming single um, and navigating the world of dating and online dating and having those conversations. But when you get kind of empowered to think like, actually, you know, like boundaries are sexy, like saying, you know what, well, I don't want this kind of touch, but I really want to explore this kind of touch because that might make me feel good. Um, and, you know, it did take me time. I would say sort of four or five years to just come to terms with like my body is how it was. But, you know, at the moment I'm actually having quite a lot of fun online dating <laughs> and nice. it's taken a long time. Yeah, and it's just great. But also working out what I like and what I want from people and actually if I've encountered people that kind of don't get it, they're not worth my time. People it's a that good will... screening, isn't it? Yeah, in a way. It, it sort of, it, it it does cut out sort of a lot of people that, you know, really you don't want to be sort of um, intimate with. So exploring intimacy with a lot of different people and having that opportunity and that confidence. But it, it, did, it came from a lot of support as well and navigating finding that support so I was able to access psychosexual therapy which was very helpful and I did get that on the NHS and I found that through a sexual health clinic because uh, you know like you said sexual health it, you know it's, it's a health matter it's something that we're in entitled to um, so it wasn't from my oncology team it was actually going to the local sexual health clinic explaining the issues I was having and they were able to refer me to psychosexual therapy that just took me on a journey to understand that my body was valid as it was and that I could navigate being intimate with people and and I was completely deserving of that. It's so interesting how we can look at other people and go, of course, like that's yeah. what we want for it. Like yeah. if it was our friend, even someone that we haven't met before, we're like, oh, of yeah. course you should be enjoying your life and your pleasure and having that time, that intimacy. And yet it's so, we're so quick to take it away from ourselves sometimes, as well as mm. feeling a bit lost as to where to look to get it back. So Cheryl, if someone's listening to this and they're like, okay, <laughs> I think I want to take a step towards uh, reigniting or uh, reimagining, like re-navigating this kind of new territory, what is the first step that you would say to someone? I think I'd say to them, just imagine what you would like to, to experience. Use your imagination to sort of tap into what you want to feel, what it is you want to feel, what it is you want to experience and who it is you want to be with and not be with as Sarah was just talking about. But I would say, just take that first step. Contact Shush Woman Store, fantastic access to, to sexual pleasure. Fantastic, absolutely brilliant. Contact ourselves. Slide into our DMs. <laughs> you know, don't be don't be scared. Just reach out to someone. You know, even if you have to raise it with your doctor and you're really embarrassed about it, or bring bring one of our booklets along. You have a beautiful booklet. I know you can't see Thank it over you. the podcast, but it is gorgeous. Yeah. Um, and uh, and it's also online as well. Like you can. It's online. And it looks yeah. just as beautiful online. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. So they could bring that along to an appointment. And even if they don't feel confident to express themselves, you know, by asking questions or, or sort of challenging what's being said, 
take the person, the, the healthcare professional, to the page that concerns you and say, I want to talk about this. Oh, I love get that. Get them to read it. I get love them that. Get to read it. Yeah, use the book to, to, to tell your story. Because that's so much easier sometimes. It's sort of like a third party. It's like, what would you recommend in this situation if I was experiencing this? Um, it takes out, yeah, so much of that embarrassment. And I like that you started with um, imagination. It's almost like starting with those neural pathways mm. and then starting in your brain even before they yeah. you're getting into your body. Is there any place that you would recommend for material in terms of um, what to read, what to look at? There is so much available. I mean, we have a whole section within the book itself that directs you to websites and um, different, such as porn sites that are ethical. Um, there's a lot to tap into. So the material's kind of everywhere. Mm -hmm. But if you get the booklet, there's a whole page for it that can direct you and say, okay, try this, try that. It, it's, it's, a, it's a mixture of trying different things, isn't it? No one source can fix you. Yeah. So. But sometimes it is that permission, isn't it? Permission to, do it. to just do it. Don't be afraid. Don't let anyone put you off. Don't let anyone's, anyone's idea of what you should be experienced put you off. It's about you. And Sarah? Allowing things to slow down a little bit and taking the pressure off. Perhaps if the idea of having kind of full-blown sex, whatever your sex would normally be, um, that idea might just be really not something you want to engage in, but you would like some intimacy. Just allowing that to be kissing or intimate touching, where that could just be your partner's arm, or even if you're exploring um pleasuring yourself that can just be um pleasure mapping feeling sensations upon your body sarah that is such a good point you know i saw cara delvine on bbc one i don't know if you saw that um but it was a, it was like a, a sex show with Cara Delvine and she um, goes investigating around the world different sex and one of the things that she said about um, masturbation is that she was like I always go in and do the exact same thing and I'm kind of aggressive with myself um, you know but actually taking that time to slow down and really like think about what do I want and where do I want it and I don't have to go straight in to do it as efficiently as possible but I can treat my whole body as an experience and she said how that like completely changed things for her and that idea of bringing in everywhere I think is is really powerful. Cheryl did you see the news this week about ear orgasms? No, tell me more. So for some people, like literally there's little um, sort of <laughs> erections that happen inside the ear um, and it is incredibly pleasurable. Um, but the, the doctor that was talking about this that was saying it, they are actually orgasms um, was saying don't go in with a... Um, cotton bud because <laughs> that is not not what you need um but it is a real thing and for some people certain types of music um and sounds can actually stimulate that area and that's why it's it, for some it can be so intensely um yeah so have you heard of any um different forms of arousal from doing this work has anything surprised you I think it's the whole, yeah, coming away from what we deem to be the sexual organs. So that pleasure mapping, finding the central parts of your body, your shoulders, your neck, back of your neck, the side of your neck, behind your ear, down your spine, down your thigh, between your thigh, your ankles, round your wrist. There are so many pleasurable zones that I didn't really think about that you really start to pay attention to when it is that you, you want to either steer away from what was the norm for you or you just want to try something different and there's nothing wrong with that. So it's really taking that time, isn't it, to see where on those places does it for you. 
Um, but as you were talking, I was thinking about it and I, I was almost like, hmm, yeah, oh, I like that one. Mm-hmm. You know, so talking about like your brain really getting involved. And I think there is this sort of uh, brain training that happens when we're getting back into the body because many of us have had to disconnect because it's been painful. This has been so interesting. Sarah, thank you so much for being with us today. And, And tell us, where can we find you? Thank you. Well, you can find us on Instagram. So that is sex underscore cancer underscore intimacy. I think that's correct. <laughs> um, and also on emails is cancer and intimacy at gmail.com. So please pop us an email or a DM on Instagram if you'd like a booklet, if you'd like more information. And um, yeah, we will be advertising more workshops over the next few month, weeks and months. Lovely. And we're going to see you at Shine Connect. Yes. In October. Can't wait. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So I'm so glad, Sarah and Cheryl, that this is not the only conversation we're going to get to have. And you're going to be back at Shine for Shine Connect. um, And that's going to be on Tuesday, the 17th of October at seven o'clock. It's 90 minutes. um, And it's uh, Cheryl and Sarah telling you all the scoop um are you going to be showing some sex toys and um different kinds of things like that more tips more tricks i'm thinking of you as sex gurus at this point (laughs) i'd like that one we'll we'll own that one sex guru but yes we'll be back with more hints tips because we like to learn from each session so Mm -hmm. the sessions we have in between now and that date will obviously impact and influence what what takes place with Shine Connect. Lovely. So yeah, so we're we're getting. Uh, it sounds like we're getting the best of you. <laughs> so, Absolutely. <laughs> lovely. Thank you to both of you. And um, tell us if um, someone needs to find you, where can they find you? Okay, you can find us on Instagram on sex underscore cancer underscore intimacy. And on Facebook, we're down as Facebook, Mac, M-A-C, C-S-I. It's a private group on Facebook, so people can connect privately. Instagram is a bit more exposed, but Facebook, that is a private group. Excellent. No one will know you're in it. No one knows what you say. Excellent. Oh, that's so good. That's so lovely. And thank you to all of you for listening today. Please give us a review if you like this, if you've decided to take some tips from today. Uh, You don't have to write that in the review. You can keep that quiet. (laughs) But um, just let us know that you're listening, that you're enjoying it. Um, And thank you, as always, to the amazing radio facilities for sponsoring us. Till next time. Bye. Not your grandma's cancer show.